Hi everyone, I am Dairene Diaz and in this session we will engage in a debate with Carolyn Sanders. She's a researcher and an artist exploring how new kinds of data sets such as emotional data, traumatic data or political data can then affect algorithms uh, through the lenses of social justice and intersectional feminism, for instance. Uh, her work shows how these outputs can be actualized as art pieces and she works in the intersections of critical design, data, AI, and art. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to talk to Caroline um, today, uh, especially about her projects that she presented in her talk, uh, them being like a social media breakup coordinator, high resolution, um, feminist data set, and TKR. So at first, we have a little comment that a uh, participator left on uh, the CDIM webpage. So the person said, hello, Caroline, I'm, I really appreciate your critical design approach for thinking about challenges that algorithms confront us with. Even though you emphasize the procedural character of art, uh, there seem to be tangible results, such as um, uh, TDR. And as I uh, have seen on your website, there are some parts of your feminist data set toolbox projects that are still TBD, not to be defined, uh, which makes this person wonder if one can participate in this amazing, amazing project. Uh, that's also something that I'd like to know um, if it's possible to join somehow the project, and I'll let uh, Carolyn tells, uh, tells us a bit about it. Hi, Carolyn. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And, and what a wonderful question. Um, I mean, Vimus Data Set is a collaborative project. So the first section with the workshops, that is really done with all workshop attendees. Um, TRK also had a lot of collaborators. So KDM, Ian Arnu Fuma, um, and Rainbow Unicorn. The next steps will also, I will most likely be working with collaborators. I can't imagine doing them alone. So yeah, I am. Um, I am open to collaboration. Um, I think the thing I should say is, uh, for me, I am also um, at times a little uh, selective in terms of collaboration. Uh, I think when we like engage in a deep collaboration with people, which uh, these these projects end, uh, often end up being, it's always important to make sure that I think much like much like dating uh, that you sort of. Um, are, are on the same page. Um, but I am like super open to working with other people. I'm super open to chatting about the project with people and trying to figure out ways if other people want to like plug in. Um, so yeah, so feel free to send me an email and we can definitely chat about the project. Awesome, cool. Yeah, sorry, TRK, <laughs> the acronym sometimes. Um, Awesome. So I have some questions too. First, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk. Um, you left me like with, with plenty of, of ideas and, and questions. And first, I'd like to ask a question that I guess um, a lot of us are receiving in this moment of the pandemic. If perhaps do you have any incoming projects uh, that are specifically addressing uh, what we have been living with the COVID-19 pandemic, if they have some how we inspired you to reimagine aspects of your uh, current projects, uh, perhaps to take into account the inequalities that we have seen that have been deepening uh, during the pandemic, and how that would, hit, would be like taking shape somehow. Um, yeah, I've definitely been inspired by um, a bit, I guess, by the pandemic, and it has definitely affected my work. Um, so mm -hmm. I worked on a project with Omidyar Network and the Mozilla Foundation on looking at how creators were responding to this moment and um, how how they were like re, I guess how they were sort of preparing their communities for being in a purely digital space. Um, so like how how they were building, how they were building uh, their own processes, for example. So um, being, I think, uh, like living during this global pandemic has changed everything about the way that we are working and collaborating, right? It isn't just changing the way that we engage with um, audience members or our like broader community. It's also changing the ways in which we engage with our really close community, right? So like, I think Decidium is a really great example of that. Um, part of your team is distributed. Part of the team is in Barcelona. The speakers are distributed. A lot of our communication here is like set up through like, telecommuting channels and portals, right? Like video conferencing. 
Um, so you're, I think this is a really great use case to think of all the work you did across digital tools to, to build a, a process that makes sense for speakers, that makes sense for the actual organizers of the event, and then also for attendees. Um, so within this research, um, I isolated um, a kind of process that I'm calling digital duct taping. So uh, organizers using multiple digital tools together to create a workflow. So like duct taping all the tools together to create this sort of cohesive workflow, but the tools themselves don't actually sync up together. So you can go from Airtable to Slack to Jitsi to like a WhatsApp group um, to then, you know, uh, for example, piping in a talk into another portal where like people are like live commenting that all that workflow has to be decided and written out. That's digital duct taping. So for me, I think mm -hmm. as a, um, as a designer, uh, this is, I, I find these moments um, interesting and I think they're also worth studying and, and responding to, to also see where are, where are there gaps that need to be improved. Um, so I often approach this through like an online harassment research mechanism, um, but also just like a cognitive overload of like, what does it mean to be sort of in this space? So definitely, uh, definitely COVID-19 has influenced um, the things that I'm looking at for sure. And um, then on another project, I'm collaborating with Ellen Powell, the former CEO of Reddit, who's with uh, a nonprofit called Project Include. We are looking at the rise of remote workplace toxicity and harassment as so many companies have moved to be remote working during this moment. So we're trying to look at what are new and emerging forms of harassment in the workplace that are like either popping up or are amplified because of this, uh, this sort of remote working environment we're in. That's super interesting. Well, wow, yeah. Um, so I have another question. Um, after watching your talk, uh, I was super interested in, in how you uh, describe it, like the deep research method methodology, right? You say that you usually don't go for a small uh, sip, but you do this um, uh, deep diving. And I was wondering um, if you could tell us a bit more about how uh, this uh, deep research methodology works and um, a bit about your creative process uh, when are usually uh, creating a research art driven um, uh, project. Sure. I mean, so like, I guess like the deep dive I do into research is something that combines, um, like, I guess, traditional design research and user research, but with a focus on activism and human rights. So if I'm researching a tool, um, I want to make sure I'm not just looking at commercial uses of the tool, but I'm looking at um, activist spaces. So I'm looking at mutual aid groups, for example, or I'm looking at groups that are organizing in, a, in different cities and different countries, um, either to like fight systemic injustice, to fight surveillance, to fight governmental control, etc. So I'm really trying to inject um, things I've learned from being in the internet freedom community into mm -hmm. traditional design research. So I'm, and then I try to center those experiences when I am designing or researching. So when I'm thinking through a series of use cases or questions to, I guess, analyze uh, products or analyze a problem, I'm pulling from this fluency of, of, these, of these different experiences that I've learned about from, from my research, right? So I'm not just looking at it from the lens of how does it affect my immediate community, but I'm looking at it through a much more intersectional lens. So I'm, and I'm trying to then weight or hold all of those experiences together in equal weight. So like one experience is not overriding another. Um, I think in terms of design and art, sometimes we'll hear things like edge cases or well, that's not, that's not the way the tool is intended to be used. But I always like to say a bug is a feature until you fix it. So like tools get used in unintentional ways all the time. They get used unintentionally quite frequently. And so we need to hold those edge cases, edge cases in like heavy quotes, italicized, um, because they're not edge cases, they're people's real lives, right? And so if your tool is aiding in per se government surveillance of LGBTQI groups, then that's not an edge case, that's people's real lives in danger, right? Um, or if your tool is being used to 
harass, you know, uh, marginalized groups, that's not an edge case, right? Um, and so for me, it's more, um, I like to hold those experiences like and bring them to the forefront because I think it uh, it challenges our design process in a way that needs to be challenged and it challenges the way that we make modern tech products okay interesting thanks um, something else I was uh, super curious about I was reading a bit of the, the feminist data set uh, chapter that you have um, uploaded. It's super interesting how it's been taking place so far and all with the data gathering. And I was wondering, um, for instance, like how critical design as a perspective and design justice intersect as, as or um, blend as inspirations in your, in your projects? Um, totally. Thank you. That's an amazing question. Um, Critical design is inspiring, I think, from the way that I start to conceptualize or conceive of projects in the sense that I like to use product design as a mechanism for exploration and critical design really comes from that, the, the, the place of removing capitalism from product design. So for me, as an artist, I like to make things that look, um, that, that look like similar to what we see in the world, but are perhaps very different or unsettling, unsettlingly different, right? So I like to play with the idea that like a product can be a piece of art. Um, so I think like Feminist Data Sets a good example of that or CareBot, um, the, the social justice um, online harassment help bot that I made. Um, we see chatbots all the time in everyday life fulfilling sort of uh, help requests or like um, yeah, assistant style um, infrastructure support. So I like to play with those things. Um, like if I were an industrial designer, which I'm not, but I, I deeply respect that industry, I would definitely be rethinking how do you make almost like unusable tables, right? Or um, strange chairs. Um, as an artist, I'm deeply inspired by the architecture work of Madeline Ginz, who was exploring how could you elongate life through architecture so she and her partner would make these strange and beautiful and very strange architectural um, apartments. Like they believe you could occupy death, that you could avoid death um, through architecture, through like how the system was built. So they were building homes you're supposed to live in, but there would be weird pitches in the floor. So the floor would kind of like duck down almost. Um, windows would be placed in strange places. Um, they would use like bright colors. They would make these very futuristic style homes. And the home itself was livable. You could live there. But I don't think the usefulness didn't make it any less of an art experience, right? And so I'm inspired by that kind of movement, that kind of work of how can you make something that inherently works, but works in a way you don't expect it to. And I think that's also probably very evocative of where I did my grad degree at the interactive telecommunications program, that people are making tools or interventions that are usable or useful, but they may not be, they may not have widespread appeal. And I like that kind of poetry and what does it mean to sort of make that tool. Design justice is then injected into that process of really thinking about what am I making and who is it for and how I'm pulling in or working with, how am I either working with groups and never want to hand someone something? And also, how am I making sure that I'm taking an intersectional approach to what I'm making? So how, how can I ensure that I'm not making just a lens that is like the Caroline perception of the world, but, a per, but rather I'm making something that can be a reflection um, more holistically of what the world is to many different groups. Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, as I was um, mentioning now about the um, the process of gathering data in 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 feminist data set, uh, I was also very curious if you could tell us a bit about how has been the research process, or um, I don't know how exactly uh, which stage exactly it is in. And the, I mean, I imagine in the moving for the data training phase, perhaps. No, I, the next phases of the, the feminist data set, how has that been going? Um, and if you could tell us uh, a bit more about the TVD that I guess is also uh, yeah. curious for some people. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm currently in the process of trying to write grants 
and fundraise to continue the project. Um, so the project kind of moves as fast as I can find other people interested in it, but also mainly like um, different arts residencies or you know experimental tech funders that are interested in funding aspects of the project. So it it is um, a little slower right now. Um, so if you know anyone that's interested in intersectional feminist research into how um, algorithms are made, because we're the next step is moving into like the data model and figuring out which algorithms we should use or, or not, and if we have to build a new one. Um, so I, I'm moving into that process, which will be time intensive, as well as um, probably like monetar monetarily also intensive, um, because I, I would like to hire and pay a collaborator for their time to especially help with some of this research, especially some of the more like technical research. Um, so I that is kind of where I'm at, um, trying to find different groups that would be interested in supporting that or working together. Um, I get uncomfortable with the idea of having it be free, meaning if a group like volunteered their time, um, I would want to make sure that that it is a fair and equitable collaboration, which is why I'm like, okay, well, we should try to find someone to like fund this kind of research. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, in I guess going in a in a different direction. Um, I have been uh, reading a bit about and getting interested, for instance, in in Afrofuturism. I don't know um, to what extent it perhaps has been um, a reference to you or not. And I was wondering if somehow how and if somehow they could um, interact with like an intersectional uh, feminist perspective, for instance, in what could be a, a um, research driven art, for instance, project. I don't know if you could okay. tell us a bit about how those two could intersect a bit, Afrofuturism and intersectional uh, feminism. Sure, um, I don't really know if I'm probably the right person to answer that question, just sort of being like a, a cis white woman um, living in, in Western Europe. Um, but I do think that they obviously can intersect. I'm a big fan of different work out of Afrofuturism as well as just Afrofuturism as a area of study and you know an artistic methodology, um, a research inquiry. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I'm perhaps the right person to to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, it's a bit, I guess, the the challenge, right, on how these um, different critical perspectives are slowly but surely uh, intersecting. Um, so I mean, next question. It's definitely like, I think a lot of different um, different aspects of speculative fiction and um, futurism need to be decolonized and unpacked. And I'm, you know, I think it's amazing that there has been, um, there's, there have been some artists that I'm really big fans of that have been, you know, engaging with, with Afrofuturism. So like Ashbach is Clark um, of Hyphen Labs, mm -hmm. Hyphen Labs themselves, et cetera. Um, Flamea Siga's work with the IAPA repository, like I think those are really amazing projects. Um, and I think there is already inherent element of intersectionality to them because it is also addressing black identity and sci-fi. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's good to have those, uh, those recommendations and those references, thanks. And um, I guess, Turning towards, for instance, something that can be quite interesting um, to this idiom. Uh, I'd like to ask if you could tell us a bit of what pitfalls you think could be uh, for a platform that is on the go and constantly uh, preoccupied and, and trying to work from an intersectional perspective. But of course, since it's from a very uh, procedural uh, perspective and sometimes um, the this tension of how you work with that perspective on the go, if you uh, could tell us a bit of like, um, what could be pitfalls in this process of trying to constantly uh, uphold that perspective? Well, I think the thing I always try to tell people is I work with context. Um, so I, I always have a hard time of being like, how do you do why? And I'm like, okay, like, well, in like what context? Um, because I, I think 
these are the, the, this is a tool and a toolkit, right? And so you don't use one tool for every project. A hammer, you know, not everything is a nail when you have a hammer, right? And I think it's important to understand that. So for me, everything is is deeply context driven. Um, so like, you know, we could, I mean, if you're open to it, we could brain brainstorm right now. You know, if you want to give me like two two examples and we could work through like how how I would approach either of them. Um, I am like a realistic person as well as an idealistic person. So when I'm working with a group, I'm really trying to look at what are the actual constraints that group has, right? Or when I work with um, an NGO or a for-profit client or, or an artistic space, what are the real world constraints, right? Because we aren't starting from zero. We're often starting with processes that have already been put in place. Um, and then we have to also look at what the intentions are of the question we're trying to answer. So in some cases, I am allowed to come in and and help people start from zero. I'm I'm, I'm allowed to help them reconfigure, you know, how how they're even constructing how how they ask questions, how they build teams, how they write their policy, right? Um, but in other cases, I'm coming in not in that case. I'm coming in for a short period of time. And what I am doing is effectively applying a series of band-aids. Um, but within that, while I'm applying these band-aids, I'm also trying to then teach people how, when there is another accident that happens, or when something happens, instead of using a band-aid, band -aid, here's how you could maybe do surgery, right? This metaphor is sort of falling apart. But what I mean is sometimes I come in, and I'm only there for a short period of time, and I'm responding to something that is, um, like is temporal in a way. It is maybe a design sprint that's ending, but I'm trying to leave best practices and education that people can use when I'm not in the room for when they're doing something else. They don't necessarily need to be doing band-aids. They can actually think about other options, right? So as opposed to just sort of like plugging a hole, how do you rebuild the system? So a lot of what I work on is sort of walk this line. Um, a lot of it, I think, is also the realization that, like, um, when I'm invited into a process, I have to, like, look at how I'm invited in and what is the role that I serve there. Am I, am I window dressing? Am I ethics washing? Or am I working with a group in a more educational or, or um, uh, pe pe pedagogy-based way, right? Um, so, like, how, how am I engaging with someone? You know, like, what is the pedagogical framework of which I'm supposed to be there, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it really does differ person to person. I have my own metrics too of how I measure success or not success. Um, and I have my own, you know, metrics and frameworks for how I determine on how I'll work with a client or if I will work with that client. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. The, the process about it always requires um, a deep look into the specific situation you're in and but yeah I guess uh, a lot of the recommendations and, and how your own process works uh, helps a lot into uh, thinking of how that could take place. Totally. Uh, do you want to come I mean do you feel like commenting something specifically um, there's something that um, comes to mind. I guess we're, we're coming to the night, to the final um, five minutes. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I guess like it, it, it up, up to you, right? Like we could talk about some of the like more traditional design work I do or some of the artwork. I mean, mm -hmm. it, again, it, it all really, it all really differs. Like I felt, I felt really lucky working with Ellen Pau currently that, um, we were able to really design the research process we wanted and we're being, we are able to move at the speed of which the, the project is letting itself move. Um, so right now the project is moving faster than we both anticipated. And so we're, we're responding to that. We are like, okay, great. Well, we may actually finish this up before time, um, like before, you know, before our intended deadline. Um, and but th this was also a project where I wasn't just brought in with like a budget. Ellen and I crafted the budget. Ellen and I found partners together to work with. We then fundraised together. Um, and so I felt very lucky to have been invited in really at 
at the ground on that project that I'm not just sort of plugging in to a process. Um, but you know, then then there are there are other projects where you just have to plug in. Like that's just the nature of how big the company is or how big the project is. Like I've definitely come in with collaborators and what they've really needed is someone to like help them think through the final leg of the project, right? They have all the findings, they just don't know how how to lay them out, right? Or or how to cohesively share them. Um and that's, you know, that's fun and fine as well, right? Like that's just it's just a different kind of work. Yeah, so I guess uh one thing that seems to be very interesting in your projects is uh, also this ability to have flexibility and, and adaptability to engage with the different um, inputs and timing it seems to be uh, something that you have been doing quite well uh, during the project oh yeah That's thank you interesting. yeah I mean I um, I really like having a lot of different projects like my dream has always been like can I can I either build a design firm that you know does really interesting creative technology and art, but that like sort of functions the way, not well. This is gonna sound weird, but it functions the way in terms of how you place people on projects. It's similar to advertising, meaning you'll have like five projects you're working on at once. Um, I worked briefly in advertising. I didn't really love the things I was making, but I loved the variability of what I was working on. Um, and I've always wanted to sort of bring that into more of a you know, social good or human rights, internet freedom context or aspect of how, how, how can you work on like four really interesting projects at once that have four very different constraints and, you know, very different outputs. And I think, um, I feel very lucky I've been able to build a career where I can do both art and research because that sort of, that feeds into that variability. Um, and it's something I really, really like doing. And it sort of, my brain kind of works in that way. I'm all, I'm always holding, multiple ideas or multiple threads of things in my head together. Like when I'm writing, I need some kind of music on. Um, I'll, I don't spend one day working on entirely one thing. So if I'm writing, I'm often writing two things that day. Um, I like that kind of stimuli and that kind of, kind of change. I guess I like that kind of uh, chaos. <laughs> Well, I'm sure it uh, serves as well in this, uh, in such a complex and uh, challenging uh, context that we live in. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it has been extremely interesting and inspiring to talk to you today. Um, we're about to close. We're going to, I mean, close this session, but we're going to continue the debates. Uh, the next session is going to be Refactorizando Género uh, with Carolina Romero, uh, Vera Rochman, Alejandra Gonzalez, and Thais Ruiz de Alda. So I'm going to uh, pass along so that the next debate can go on. Thank you very, very much, Carolina. It has been a pleasure talking to you. And stay tuned. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for, uh, for giving me your time. I appreciate it.